Hey guys, my name is Jason with Mount Baker Mining and Metals, and on today's video, I have an epic adventure for us. We're going to head over to Eastern Oregon, we're going to do some underground gold mining, we're going to bring the ore back, crush it up here, smelt it down, and I'm going to do something I've never done before. I'm going to refine down our gold and silver to a super high purity. So stay tuned for all that, but first, I got to head over to Eastern Oregon and get mining. We're back in Eastern Oregon, we're going to go gold mining back here underground in this old abandoned gold mine. So in a previous video, we were in here, we were taking some samples, and we found a really, really hot spot, really, really high grade gold. It's averaging five to 10 ounces. We got one assay that was over 20 ounces a ton, I think. So we're back, and today our goal is to go down that hole there, back to our high grade area. And I'm gonna knock down as much of that high grade as I can onto a tarp, get it bagged up, bring it back to the shop and run it through the system. So let's go check out what we're gonna be working on today and see how much we can get. All right, here's our first little obstacle. We gotta go down this ladder, down to the second level here. It's about, I don't know, 15 feet or so. So we'll get down here onto the lower level. And it looks like there was just a heck of a rain event here not too long ago because there's a bunch of stuff that's all washed down here so there's a bunch of water running down these creating little gullies and all of this organic matter and junk washed in here and then here right above us if you look straight up oh there's daylight so that's where the old miners went to the surface and we're going to be working up here today. I'll put a link for a card or whatever up in the corner if you want to check out our first video where we took these samples. But we're going to be working right up here. This was the really, really rich spot. And I've been looking and thinking about this since we were in here. And I don't know if it's going to show up very well, but there's the vein. It's striking more or less east-west. And then I don't know if you're gonna be able to see this, but I'll try and show you up here on the wall, right there, running down that way is a fault. And it kind of offsets the vein right here. But there's where the vein comes back. And then there's a little hole up to the first level. And that's where we're going to be working. Now, I pointed out that offset fault right in there. Because oftentimes, and more and more what I'm finding is where a vein and a fault intersect, or two veins intersect like that, it becomes very, very rich. And I don't know if that's where the original mineral fluids came up and then they squirted off in this vein, or if there was something happening there. But typically... When these veins are forming, if you get a change in pressure, temperature, or chemistry, oftentimes the minerals will fall out at that location. And what better place to do that than the intersection of the fault? You can see there's some copper staining here. The owners told me that the copper staining is a really good indication of high grade. He's done a bunch of slab work on this stuff. Up here you can see there's very little copper staining. It's pretty much isolated to this side, the foot wall side of the vein. And the vein here is probably about 12 to 16 inches wide across there. We're going to, and it's really nice because I got this big overhang I can work all the way up. I've got a little roto hammer chisel thing. I've got my hammer and chisel. I got a bunch of fun stuff we're going to use today. But I'm going to lay out a tarp down here, and I'm just going to start wailing away on that thing and see how much we can get. Well, I'm disturbing all kinds of wildlife in here. There's a bat flying around. Let's see if it'll come back again. And then there's a pack rat sitting right there in that stall. bats in here. I'm 
<sighs> I've got all sorts of tools here today. Got that battery powered roto hammer. I think what I'm going to use first though is just a good old hammer and chisel. See how much I can knock off of there easily. I'll get worn out pretty quick on that, I'm sure, but give it a shot. See what I can knock off of there. I'm going to be wearing a respirator for the quartz dust. There's a bunch of pack rat, we'll call it poop, <laughs> for the video <laughs> down here. So I don't want to be breathing a whole bunch of that stuff. So I'll be all pee-peed up and uh, we'll see what we get. We're about 30 seconds into it here, and I've already found a huge piece of gold right there. And I should have got it in the face when it was sticking in the face, but I was so excited to get it out and show you guys. But that's a pretty dang nice piece of gold there. And then looking up here at the face, see if I can get this. Uh, there's kind of gold sprinkled all through it. There's a piece. There's some. There's some more up here. Right up here. I can't, I can't see the camera, so I hope I'm getting it here. But it looks like there's a little swath right, right here, here to here, that's just loaded, loaded with gold. And, and I'm in the copper area where the owner told me to go. So I'm just gonna, oh boy, I'm just gonna start working right in here. And uh, there might be a little bit more up in here too. A bunch of galena maybe, that gray galena. But yeah, that's, that's really, really nice looking stuff. Holy smokes. All right, well, I like the hammer and chisel just cause it's a little more delicate and allow me to, like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and pry this piece out right here. I wanna save a bunch of these specimens for the owner. He's coming a little bit later today. Um, but let me work with that hammer and chisel a little bit more and <clears throat> see if we can find some more specimens. Well, I better get some on video here before I hand cob all this out of here. Um, right up in here, see the gray? I think that's galena. I'm finding it right along with that galena. Here's kind of that, that first strip we were talking about where I saw it all at the beginning. I don't see a whole lot here right now. Um, there might be some right up in there. I don't know if you can see it right there and there maybe. Um, but it's breaking up really nice and easy. I'm hardly, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm spending more time looking at it than I am hitting on it. Um, but after, I don't know, five, maybe 10 minutes, I probably got 50 pounds in the ground. <clears throat> I want to work on this big knob here so I can work it all the way back. There's some really good looking stuff back over here, but I don't want to be under there hitting. And this is all kind of ravelly ground in here. And, all these big knockers, I don't want anything to come down on my head, especially as I open up this hole bigger. It, I don't know what's gonna happen. So I'm just gonna be careful and just kind of not work with anything over my head. Ground up above looks really good and competent. So I'm just gonna work this back a little bit. And, but there's, man, there's some really, really good stuff in here. I hope we get a bunch of gold when we run the equipment.
Well, I've got quite a bit of A knocked out of there now. And I'm gonna work on getting this big Doniger right here out of there. I don't like that over my head. So I've got, this is the second tarp full. I'm gonna put this in sacks. But a lot of nice looking stuff in there. I've got a couple pieces that's some nice gold on them. But the tarp's working really well. I can just kind of get it all into a nice little pile, get it up. I probably got 75 pounds there. So I'll get this cleaned up, put into a couple sacks, and then we'll come back. I'll knock a bunch of that waste off of there and just put it on the ground. And then I can keep going in that vein. That'll open up that vein a little bit more for me. Everything down has to come up. It all comes up this ladder. Uh, one sack at a time. Uh -oh. Well, I got a little ladder in my spot here so I can get up and, and chisel down from the top. And man, that is making a huge difference. Look at the pile of muck I got here. It took me about 15 minutes. I probably got four or five sacks there. And uh, I really got a big old chunk out from the upper section of the vein there. And there's a level above me. And I think what happened is when they were going through and putting in this level above me, uh, their blasts shattered the quartz down about a foot into the foot, uh, no, not the foot wall, but the, the floor of that upper level. And so it made it all real loose and it was super easy chipping. But now I've got this big knob here that uh, is real hard. And I've got this little bottom of around here in the foot wall. I think I may try and take out some of that foot wall and then I've got somewhere I can slab this hard vein into. Um, but I'm going to get all this muck off the floor first and get it bagged up and then see about getting the rest of that big chunk of vein out of there. It's good looking stuff. The vein's really pinching fast up here. It's only about, I don't know, eight inches wide up there. And as you can see underneath, it pinches down. So. Once we get this big chunk out of here, we'll see what the vein's doing and what it looks like. Also up there, I'm kind of running out of mineralization. So uh, we'll see, we'll see what happens. Well, I dug a little bit around the foot wall, that vein it goes back in there maybe eight or 10 inches. And I really don't like to be picking on the walls much because there's a big slab up there that worked its way down and all this is just kind of hanging here. But it's on the foot wall. I'm not too terribly worried about it. Uh, so I'm gonna work on this chunk. If it was if it was up on the hanging wall, you know, and hanging over your head like that, that big slab, that's, that's no good. Um, but now I can try and just kind of slab that, that big chunk into that hole that I made. I got my tarp cleaned up. We got eight bags of muck out of that. And, uh, that ends up being about 400 pounds. That hole up there that I made is roughly a foot and a half 
deep, two feet long, and about a foot wide or so. Uh, and so I think for 400 pounds, I think that's about three, three and a quarter cubic feet. So we're, we're right around 125 pounds of cubic feet, which I think about what quartz weighs. Um, so anyway, that was, that was kind of an interesting little calculation, but let's get going on this big chunk and see what we can get out of it. Well, it's still pretty hard. It's I've knocked a little bit off of there, but I'm going to try one of these feathering wedges. And there's kind of a natural little seam there. Dan Hurd introduced me to these. Thanks, Dan. He gave me a few as well. Um, so I'm going to try and drill a hole right in here somewhere and put that wedge in like that and see if I can wedge this, this big old knob off this wall. So I'll show you after I get the hole drilled and see if I can video as I hammer that thing down. All right, I got her in there. Let's see if I can do all this at the same time. Kind of, I'm kind of perched on the ladder over a hole sideways in a, anyway, let's see if this works. Oh, it broke something up. I'm going to get my hammer drill and chisel away what I broke up there and take a look. Maybe I should have tried to wedge it off that crack. All right, let's try it this way. That's something happened there. That worked pretty good. I'll do that again. Thank you, Dan. I got my chisel right in the hole. And it's coming. There it nice. Well, there's our vein. Got that big old knob knocked off of there. Got a big old pile of muck here. I got a bag up. And uh, I don't know how many bags I got, but I think I can carry about 20 or so back with me. I got my little pickup today, so I don't want to do a whole lot more work and have bags that I can't take with me. So I'm going to get this bagged up and we'll take inventory of how much muck we got. All right, guys. There's all 18 sacks in the back of the truck every single one of those had to come up that ladder through the underground workings up the ladder and then across to the truck and man oh man am i tired but we're all loaded up so i'm gonna head home so i've got these 18 sacks that have the raw ore in them and i'm gonna start with putting them through this jaw crusher here this is a six inch by ten inch jaw crusher and the ore is fed in this hopper. It'll crush down through these jaws. 
and come out the bottom into a bucket. And once they're all crushed up into buckets, I'll bring them over here and put them down through the hammer mill. So the hammer mill is going to take that half inch minus gravel, crush it down to 70% passing 30 mesh and 50% passing 50 mesh. There's a screen in the bottom half of the hammer mill with 0.8 millimeter slots in it. We feed water into the hammer mill through the side of the case and down through the top where the ore gets fed. That creates a really nice slurry and everything stays in there until it can come out those slots down that orange chute into the distributor trough of the shaker table. Once the ore is fed onto the shaker table, it gets evenly distributed through these ports on the distributor trough and all the dense material, primarily the gold and silver and any sulfides fall down in these long grooves in the rubber and all the precious metals and sulfides work their way across the table. Only the heaviest minerals can come up the long grooves, gold, silver, and the heaviest sulfides, such as galena. They'll work up onto the cleaning plane and down this edge of the table into the number one and number two port. As they work their way down the cleaning plane, the water from this water bar washes the less dense material away and back down the cleaning plane towards the grooves and the gold and silver make a really nice clean line that works down into the number one. There's a number three port here on the shaker table. This is where the middlings go. So most of the sulfides will end up here. There's a little aluminum splitter right here that you can adjust left or right. And that will cut the middlings from the tailings. The tailings flow down this pipe into this buried tank and the tailings and water settle out here and the water is recycled and repumped back up to the system, to the hammer mill and the shaker table for recycling. All right, we got 18 bags, now we got 18 buckets. I weighed four of the buckets and averaged them out by weight and they were 22 and a half kilograms. So right in these 18 buckets, we have roughly 400 kilograms worth of ore we're gonna run through our system. And a lot of you guys have asked me, what happened to the whole turnkey system? You used to have a whole jaw crusher and conveyor belts and all the stuff. I actually had to sell it because there's such a high demand for all this piece of equipment that I've been selling all my demo equipment. So to answer your guys' question, that's where it went. But if you're interested in any of these pieces of equipment, give us a call or shoot us an email. You can find our contact information in the description below. So let's get these samples run and we'll see how much gold we have.
Well, I don't know if you can hear me, but this is really nuggety. Sometimes there's lots of gold on the table, and other times there's not. There's a pretty good little glug of gold right here. And it seems to be associated with the Galena. It's that kind of blue-gray mineral out here in front. And it seems to be that when there's more Galena, there's more gold. And it's all coming down into the number one right here. There's quite a bit of pyrite in it over here. And that's mostly coming into the number two. There's very little sulfides coming down into the number three, a little bit of quartz. And then we got a nice clean cut between the number three and the number four. So it's all, it's all quartz going that way. But yeah, it's real spotty. Some buckets seem to have a lot more gold than others. And we're down to our last five, four or five here. Well, I don't know if you can tell in the dirty water, but I think most of that line is all gold. Going right down into the number one. That's the best line I've seen all day. Right at the end of the run, that last bucket. There it comes down. Number one. Can you see the pile of gold right there? There's a pretty nice gold line, huh? Look at that going all the way down. That gold is so, so fine. But it runs all the way down. So there's going down to the number one. And that gold just runs all the way up the table. Super, super fine stuff. But we've got some nice gold. Nice gold line. All right guys, well the shaker table's finishing up behind me. We're cleaning up and brushing down the table to get all the gold off. And while I'm thinking of it, I want to mention a few things. We assayed it, it assayed about 15 ounces a ton. There is not seven and a half ounces <laughs> in that number one concentrate bucket. So I wanted to set expectations early that, that it's not gonna be a seven and a half ounce pour at the end of this video. And the reason why that might be is there's a couple reasons. One is something called the nugget effect. When you assay for gold, if there's a super, super rich area in the vein and you get a little piece of that, it can throw off the whole assay and kind of skew your results to show way more gold than if you just go in and take the whole vein. So that might be part of it. The other part is, you saw the gold hopefully in the video, it's super, super fine. We may have a liberation problem. I maybe only liberated 30%, 50%. I'm not really sure, but I've got a, a sample of the tailings coming out of the number four trough, and I'm gonna get those assayed. Usually it takes a couple weeks. So if I don't have the results by the time I post this video, I'll put the results in the description below so you can check out the assay results of the tailings and that'll tell us how much gold we didn't liberate from the rock because I didn't grind it fine enough. The hammer mill can only grind so fine, but I'm working on another machine here. Hopefully in the next six months, I'm going to show you how I'm going to grind all these tailings finer and release more gold. The other possibility is there could be some values locked up in the sulfides, not chemically, but sometimes you'll have little grains of gold that get grown around by a grain of pyrite or a grain of galena. So there might be quite a bit more value in our number one and number two cons than we can visually see. And that will come out with the smelting process. But let's get the table cleaned off. We'll get our number one and number two concentrates. We'll go smelt them down and we'll see how much gold we have. All right, here's our number one concentrates. The jug weighs about 40 grams, 50 or so with the water. So 13 100 grams, and here's the number two, which I don't think I can weigh on this scale. Oh, yeah, it's about four kilograms. So call it roughly five, 
five kilograms from 400 kilograms is 100 to one concentration ratio. 80, 85, somewhere in there. Well, here's a look at our gold. Yeah, and that was just kind of a quick and dirty pan. There's some in there. So that's our next step. We'll get this in the furnace and melt it down and see how much gold we have. And then over here in this pan is the, the panning tailings. So I'm going to smelt that down separate and see how much gold we have in the panning tailings. But there's this gray mineral over here. And it's super heavy. I believe it's galena. I panned a lot of it out. But it is very hard to pan. And if we smelt it down and we get just a whole bunch of lead in our button, we'll know that's that lead galena, lead sulfide. Well, what I've done here is I've panned down the number one cons down to a small amount. And the reason is I wanted to see if I can keep the free gold separate from the other number one concentrates. These are the panning tailings. And the idea is to see if most of the gold is in this stuff is free gold, or if there's a significant amount of gold left in the number one panning tailings. I tried to keep as much free gold out of this as possible. And so what we're going to do is smelt them both down separately. If there's a a bunch of gold in here and hardly any in here. We're gonna know that most of our gold in this ore is free and I can just pan it out. If there's half gold in here and half value in here, we're gonna know that there's still a significant amount of gold in the sulfides from the concentrates and we can just smelt them all down together and recover our gold. Here's the enriched number one concentrates that I panned out. I've got 86 grams. I think I've got enough precious metals in here and I think that sulfide is galena. So I've got enough lead in there. I'm not gonna add any lead collector. Here we are all mixed up. I edited the formula a little bit. I've got 40 grams of silica, 120 grams of soda ash, and I added 30 grams of potassium nitrate.
while we let the second pour cool down, let's get this one weighed. It's cooled down enough I can touch it. And it should just pop right off of there. There we go. So there is that. That's from our number one panning concentrates. 24 grams. So that's about three quarters of an ounce. And I can tell you from the assays that we did that this stuff should be about 70% gold and 30% silver, according to the assays. So whatever three quarters of three quarters is, what's that like? Half at 0.55 ounces of gold. And it's definitely yellowish in color, but it's quite white. A very, very light brassy color. So that is less than I was expecting. I was hoping for two or three or four ounces. Um, but let's see what's in that lead that's from the panning tailings of the number one. There might be quite a bit of gold and silver in there as well. Well, this stuff's cooled down a little bit now. But I've noticed since I've started using oxidizer that I get this interesting little layer on top. And so the potassium nitrate that I use must not mix with the slag. And so I get this, this t separation on top of the pour. And that's why you don't see that surface of the sun texture anymore is because this stuff is floating right on top and the surface of the sun texture is underneath. So I thought I'd point that out. I, I have not seen that before, but it's kind of cool to see them separate. But this is cooled down now. So let's... Hopefully the lead's not molten at the bottom. Let's see what happens. Lead's still molten. See it here? Splattered out of there. Son of a gun. Well, this is a nightmare. This is exactly what I keep warning everybody about on these videos. I, I took the temperature on the top, and usually when the temperature's below about five or 600 degrees, the lead is solid in the bottom. But I'm wondering if this stuff on the top maybe acts as an insulation layer. And so this cools off faster than the stuff underneath. Let me, let me take the temperature of this stuff right now. So, oh yeah, see that's still 700 degrees. That's way hotter than the melting point of lead. So from now on, I gotta make sure I get this layer off the top so I can get an accurate reading on the temperature. Dang, what a mess. All right, well, we, the good news is we haven't lost anything. So I'll just collect all this lead here, this stuff here. I'll see if I can break off the slag once it cools down and try and recover the lead. Worst, absolute worst comes to worst, we'll just smelt it all back down again and re-pour it. Holy moly, look at this mess. So I got lead stuck in the inside of the mold. I got lead dripped all down around the outside. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna put it back in the furnace and re-smelt it. I uh I guess I'll pick out whatever I can here. Oh, see, learn from my mistakes. Don't be in a hurry. Let the lead cool down. Well, I got upset with it after I poured it in the cone mold. So I just dunked her in water. It's just been soaking in water about three or four minutes. So everything should be nice and cold. There. That's what you're supposed to get. Nice, solid lead chunk on the bottom. And there's our, there's our slag. No matte layer in there, so that's good. I got a nice uniform piece of lead. I did not add any lead in there, so that is all from the ore itself. So let's figure out how much we got. We started with about a kilogram worth of concentrates. Well, it's all cleaned up and it weighs 500 grams, so about half of the weight of the concentrates was lead. 
and all your gold and silver is going to be in here. It's actually a little bit hard when I when I pound on it. I pound it on a corner here somewhere, and it's a little bit hard. So I'm wondering if we got some copper mixed in with it. But now we got to get rid of. I don't want 500 grams of lead. That that'd take forever to cupel away. So what I'm going to do is show you my new trick on how to get all this lead out. So I'm going to take our lead block and remelt it down. So I'll turn it back on, but it's going to melt pretty quick. Then I'm going to pour it in water and corn flake it. And then I'm going to oxidize all that lead away. So I'm just going to take our lead and pour it in a bucket of water. Uh, drain the water off and there's what it looks like so I'm gonna bring all that out I should have used deeper water because it's kind of clumped together it still has a bunch of surface area but kind of clumped which isn't ideal but we're gonna go with it so let's just scrape all this out into a bin here and you can actually see if you look close it's kind of copper colored, some of it. So again, I think there's some copper in there. We'll get that in there. Keep the water out as best we can. Now what we're gonna do, because we have a huge amount of surface area on the lead, I can add a bunch of oxidizer and oxidize away, or oxidize, the lead and the copper and the base metals, all the junk in there we don't want, and all the precious metals will collect at the bottom, and then we'll have a much smaller button to work with. We don't have to keep L 500 grams, we might have to keep L 50, or maybe 20. We'll see what we come up with. I've mixed up our metal. I have 500 grams of potassium nitrate, which is probably way too much, but I'm gonna pour the coals to it and try and get all these big chunks oxidized. I've put in about 300 grams of borax, anhydrous borax, and about 100 grams of silica sand, and that's gonna absorb all those oxides we're gonna make, and hopefully we'll have a precious metal button at the end of our pour here. It's not my day today. I have this crucible break right here. A big crack in it. So it leaked all over my furnace. See down there, I got a big puddle of slag down there. All right, I had it in the water again. We'll see what happens. Oh, a bunch of junk. All right, here we go. Third time's a charm.
There's our button off the bottom of the second pour. Weighs 162 grams. So there's 1,700 grams of the number two concentrates in there. I'm going to add 340 grams of silica sand, 1,360 grams of soda ash, and 340 grams of potassium nitrate. So it's 20% silica, 80% soda ash, and then an additional 20% potassium nitrate. I had to increase our crucible to the number 20. And I'll do two smelts in there. Well, it's not the prettiest looking butt in the world. On this one, this is the number two concentrates, all the lead and everything. I oxidized as much away, and it looks like there's hardly any lead left in the button when I put it in the cupel. Because it's about the same size. So let's see how much it weighs. There's, it looks like, you can't really see it on the camera, but it looks like there's some slag left around the outside there. So I might have to get that one cleaned up a little bit more, but. Well, there they are, all three buttons. The one on the left is the free gold that I panned out and smelted down the number one panning concentrates. The middle one is the panning tailings from the number one concentrates. And then this nasty looking thing over here on the right is the number two concentrates. And they vary in gold content. This one's the yellowest, so it has the most gold, probably about 70. I don't know if you can tell on camera. It doesn't look like it from what I'm filming, but this one also has a little bit of tinge to yellow, of yellow, so that might be 50% gold. And this one is pretty silvery, and the silver sprouts give it away that it's more gold, or more, more silver than gold. So we have 163 grams. It might be half gold, maybe 60%. So what's that, 80 grams? That's a little over two and a half ounces, I believe, of gold. But what this tells me is I have to do something that I've resisted for years. I'm gonna to have to make a follow-up video on these three, parting with nitric acid and purifying the gold. This is the stuff from the number one. I've cleaned it up a little bit more with cupelling, and I'm gonna make something out of this later uh, in a separate video. So I'm gonna just set that aside, that's already nice refined stuff that I can make into some jewelry or something. Now the first thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna melt these two buttons together and get them cleaned up a little bit. They've got some junk on the back of them. They've got a little flux on the top here. So I'm gonna use this melting dish, an oxyacetylene torch to melt them, and then I'm gonna pour them in this little ingot mold here 
and hopefully we'll get a nice clean metal ingot that we can then do our chemistry on. All right, we're gonna get started here, just nice and slow. I've got it up on a fire brick, so I'm not sitting on the cold table. And we're just gonna warm everything up here, you know, nice and dried out, warmed up, so we don't start breaking anything. And just start slow, you know, there, you don't need to be in a rush here. I'm gonna try this, I'm gonna turn the oxygen way down. I'm gonna try and carbon this mold here so it doesn't stick. So there's, there that mold's got a bunch of carbon in it now. Now we'll work on getting this heated up and melt it down. And I'm gonna pour off of this lip, so I want that lip to be nice and warm. Okay, here comes the moment of truth here. Whoa! Already almost a disaster. Ooh. That was something, huh? I got a little bit of what I when I tipped that thing, when I first grabbed it, I got a little bit of precious metal stuck in the edge there. I'm not gonna worry about that too much. Let's see if we can get this flipped over. Oh yeah. Um, there we go. There's our bar. Here we go. Let me get my hot dog tongers here. <laughs> There, not bad. That worked out pretty good. A little bit more practice, we'll have that down in no time. But now let's get another weight on this bar and then we'll start the, the exciting part. We had about 100, almost 140 grams. So we lost a couple grams, probably like I said, that junk on the bottom, a little bit of slag on top. But what is it? About 138, 138 grams. But now I've got to figure out what carat this is. I've got to figure out how much gold and silver there is in this. And I'm going to show you an easy way to do that using something that Archimedes came up with about 2,500 years ago. How this works is we're going to measure the amount of water that our bar displaces. So I've got a jug of water on here. It weighs almost 700 grams. I'm going to zero it. I'm going to use just a little piece of copper wire. I'm going to submerge it into water. That's 0.8 grams. I'm going to zero that again. Now I have a wet mark on my wire. There we go. Zero. Okay. Now we get our bar. Put it on the wire. Displace it or put it under the water. Back up to my wet mark, 11.9 grams. So that means our bar displaces 11.9 grams of water. Now we can calculate the density of our bar. It weighs 138 grams, I'm rounding for easy math. And it displaces 11.9 grams of water. But here's the trick, because water is one gram per cubic centimeters, it also displaces 11.9 cubic centimeters of water. So I'm gonna take away the grams part and replace it with cubic centimeters. And now when I divide those two together, I get a density. And that equals 11.6 grams per cubic centimeter. That's the density of our bar. So now it gets a little bit more technical but we want a 25% gold, 75% silver alloy. And the reason why I know that it's just gold and silver in here is it's gone through the cupelling process and all the base metals have been removed. The lead, the bismuth, the copper, all that stuff is gone. So we just have gold and silver. We want this ratio because our nitric acid needs to have access to enough, enough silver to dissolve it all out of the alloy 
and leave just the gold sponge. So now we got to calculate the density of, of, of this. This is what we want. So you would take uh, an imaginary bar that weighs 100 grams, 25 grams of gold and 75 grams of silver. You divide it by the density of each metal, which gives you a volume of the bar, of a 100 gram bar. You take the 100 gram weight of the bar, divide it by the volume of the bar, and an alloy of 25 gold, 75% silver has a density of 11.8 grams per cubic centimeter. We have 11.6, so we're almost perfectly right on the money there. I could add a little bit more gold to this to get it up to this 11.8, but I think we're close enough. We're just gonna go with what we have. Okay, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our bar, I'm gonna remelt it back down, pour it in this water over here, and cornflake it so we can get a bunch of surface area for our acid to work on. There we have it. There's all our cornflaked gold and silver. Let's get that decanted off and into a beaker. So before we go on to the next steps, I have to give a huge shout out to Sri Tips. He's another YouTuber. He has some amazing videos on precious metal refining with acids. Everything I'm about to do here and for the rest of the video, I learned from him. So check him out. I'll put a link to his channel in the description below. Now I'm gonna get all of our alloy moved over to this beaker here. I'm gonna add about 100 milliliters of water. Then I'm gonna add about 100 milliliters of nitric acid and turn the hot plate on and we'll get this boiling. But there's gonna be some nasty fumes coming off of there, so I'm gonna go put my respirator on. There's our nitric acid. I just added a little over 100 milliliters and it immediately turned brown. Now I'm gonna cover the beaker and we'll let that heat up and boil and the nitric will work on the silver. So we're really starting to boil now. The silver or the alloy has turned pretty much black. So it's working real good. I'll have to do this several times. Now I'm getting ready for when I pour off that nitric solution. It's going to have a whole ton of silver dissolved in it. And I'm going to pour it over copper because the copper is more reactive than the silver and so it will displace the silver in the solution and the silver will come out. So I have about 164 grams of copper. That should be enough to displace the roughly 100 grams of silver we have in the solution. Well, our first boil is pretty much complete. There's just a little bit of gas coming off, but not much. The solution is clear. Nice kind of reddish tan color. So now let me get it poured off and we'll do it again. Okay, let's see how this works here. So we'll take our cover off. Oh, that's sludgy, kind of muddy. Okay, now I'll put some more water in. Some more nitric. And we'll continue the reaction. Okay, let's see what happens here. I have one little strand of copper wire. Let's see what happens when I put it in the solution. It starts to immediately foam. And that should start pulling the silver out of solution. 
and replacing it with copper in solution. Add some more. You don't want to add too much too quick. So you can see the, the blue is starting to form. It's turning, it's actually turning orange. And as the copper goes into solution, it'll turn a nice, pretty blue color. So we'll let that work and see how that comes along. When I said blue, I guess I meant green. It's turned a nice, beautiful emerald green color. And looking down, you can see the silver coming out onto the copper wire strands. Here's our second boil, much clearer than the first one. Still making some NO2, but not nearly as much. So we'll just have to see what happens. Well, our second boil is done here. No more brown gas. So I'm going to slowly pour it into here. Now it's starting, uh oh, it went too fast. That's what I did not want to happen. Quite a bit of nitric in there. Here's our brown sludge. So I think I'll do one more with the nitric acid and water. There's really no reaction at all for our third bath yet. I just put it in. But as that heat gets going, we'll see if there's any more, but the solution is pretty much colorless. Our resistance is going like crazy. This is the copper wire. I almost boiled over there. You really don't want that to happen, so you've got to be careful with that. Well, this is our third boil. It's been going about 20 minutes. There's no gas coming off. The solution's almost clear. So I'm going to decant this off and we'll filter out, hopefully, our very pure gold mud. I'm not going to pour it in with our copper solution yet. So I'll pour it into a clean beaker. A couple rinses here with clean water. Can anybody tell me why the solution is slightly yellow? Is that a little bit of iron contamination? I think silver nitrate is supposed to be clear. And then our, right over there, our copper solution is green. I thought for sure it was going to be blue. So let me know what you think on those two. Well, I have my funnel here with some filter paper. Hopefully this works. I'm going to try and get all of our gold powder down here on the filter paper. Okay, now we'll let that filter through, dry out a little bit. And the plan is to melt it down and get a nice shiny yellow gold bar. All right, I'm going to transfer this over. Now we'll burn it off. Okay, everybody, cross your fingers. This turns gold. I'm also going to use a new melting dish so we don't contaminate from any little bits of silver we had before. You want to be really, really gentle now with the torch because you've got essentially gold powder there, some of it. 
and you don't want to just blow it all over the place. I've done that in the past with plaster gold and small hard rock gold I'm trying to melt down. Oh, look at there. Can you see it? I don't know if you can see it. It's turning bright yellow. We got to melt it down. I got to kind of do double duty here. I'm going to carbonize that mold. And here we go. Okay, we got her poured. Come on. There. There it came. A little coercion there. Dang, look at that. MBMM's first purified gold. Boy, it's just nice shiny yellow. May not be the best surface appearance, but whew, it worked. That's so cool. I can't believe it worked. Oh, I can't believe it worked, but it worked so well the first time. Thank you, three tips. Okay, the big moment of truth here. There should be, I think we figured right around 30 to 35 grams. Right, 30, 30 grams or so is what we're shooting for because we were a little bit under the 25% mark. So, what'd we get? 29.65. Oh, just under an ounce. Just under one ounce. So there's a little under $2,000 of gold right there. Man, that is cool. Well, I've screwed up on the silver part. And a lot of you guys who are in the know probably saw this kind of slow motion train wreck happening from earlier in the video. I was all excited to put that fine copper wire in there because it had such a big surface area and help the reaction go along and get that silver precipitated out. But what I didn't think of is now I got to remove the copper from the solution and I have excess copper and it's all covered in silver and there's probably some fine wires that got down into the sludge the silver sludge and there's still copper on them so this is not this is not the way to do this so uh, I'm gonna have to re redo this part so learn from my mistakes but let's start this second process and hopefully by the end of the video we'll end up with pretty pure silver so let's see what we have here Oh yeah, this is a mess here. I don't... I don't really know what the best way to deal with this is. For now, let's just put it in this container. I'm going to pull out as much copper as I can. Another interesting thing I found while doing some research is I had it backwards. One gram of copper will pull like three and a half grams of silver out of solution. So I had way too much copper in here. But let me decant this off and again, get as much copper out of there as I can. So I'm just gonna pour the solution off. And this should be totally saturated now with copper. There shouldn't be any more silver in here. And we'll save this for processing later. Oh yeah, look at that. Look at that mess. Copper wire, some of it's plated with silver. Oh boy, what a mess. All right, plan, plan B. I think we're just gonna dissolve it all in nitric and then just plate the silver out, I think is what we're gonna do. 
So, we've got to mix up some more nitric here. I'm going to use our spent nitric acid. Not really spent, but this was the last boil that I did previously. There's still lots of nitric in there. So I'm going to take this, pour it into there, and then we can use the active nitric in here for our first boil. All right, we'll let that work a little bit and check on it. We'll just do a quick filter of our solution here. There's a little bit in there I'll wash down into the beaker on the hot plate. I've dissolved about as much copper and silver as I can in this solution. So let me pour off most of the solution. Now I'm going to add some water and some more nitric. Now I don't want to add too much nitric because I'll just waste it. So I'll add about 100 milliliters more water and about another 100 milliliters of nitric. And if there's still some sludge in the bottom, uh oh, that's bad, huh? Good thing I had my tray on there. Oh, we're just learning all kinds of things here. So here's the thing, I'm not scared to make mistakes, and I'm not ashamed to show you on video, because this is how we all learn. So, I'm hoping we can just do this. It's a good thing I went and got some of these trays. This is a Goodwill deal at two bucks. Let's see if I just did it again. Hopefully not. So you want to add the nitric real slow. Now here are the solutions that I just poured off. They should be saturated with copper and silver. So now I'm going to use copper pipe to precipitate out just the silver. And then I'll be able to take the copper pipe out when the reaction is complete. Look at there, silver. So we're just going to put a couple of copper pipes in there. And let the silver plate out on those. Well, it might be hard to tell in the solution. But there's no more silver plating out on the copper. So the copper silver reaction has gone to completion. There's all our silver on the bottom. Now I have this beaker over here. I'll switch the copper pipes over to once it's done filtering. And we'll cover the rest of our silver. And this should immediately start precipitating out silver. There it goes. So we'll let that go to completion. And now I can filter the silver out through our funnel and filter paper again. I'm going to rinse this stuff with hot water a bunch of times. Get all that acid out of there. This is my last rinse with hot water, probably six or seven. Now the solution is more or less clear after the silver settles out. We're doing our final couple of rinses here on our second batch of silver. Our first batch is pretty much settled out and washed. And I'm keeping all my copper nitrate filtered here in a bucket. And I've thrown those copper tubes back in just so it can, if there's any residual silver, whatever, it can just sit there and, and percolate a little bit. So that's where that's going. And here, once this is all rinsed up, we'll get it melted down and poured into a bar. We've got our silver in the filter now, and it's filtering out any last liquid. 
my buckets here are getting full of spent solution. And so once that gets filtered down and dried out some, we'll melt it in this little melting dish. Hopefully it's big enough. And then here are several different spent filter papers. And I'll deal with those again at a later date. I'm going to do this quite a bit different next time. This, this was really cool because I really wanted the silver from that, that button out of the same mine. But if I'm just refining gold from, you know, wherever, I'll probably just put it all in this bucket, throw some copper in there, let it do its thing, and not worry about it, not try and refine the silver. Because that little bar of gold we got, that was worth almost $2,000. This mud is worth like 75 bucks. And I spent two or three hours today working on this, spilling, making a mess, doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Learning a lot of good stuff. Learning a lot of really good good things about how to do this. Lots of respect for those other guys on YouTube that make this look easy. But uh, yeah, we'll get our silver melted down here and that should be the final refining part of the gold and silver out of our mine. Well, I took a little scoop of the silver out of there and it's still quite wet so i'm gonna try just a little bit so let's see how this works here with just a little bit of wet mud silver mud i've had a little borax and it looks like things are moving along here oh there wasn't much silver in that pile was there <laughs> Now I'm just going to add more to the hot dish. Well, I got our bead molten here. It's not all of it, but this is not a very efficient way to do it. So I'm going to pour it in this mold. I'm going to try something different. Well, that didn't work very well. There's just too much volume. My ingot looks like junk. So I'm actually concerned that there's some copper still in there. So when in doubt, I'm gonna put it in the furnace and melt it. So that goes in there. I'm gonna put some borax in there. I'm gonna get the rest of this funnel stuff in there. Rest of that, filter paper and all, we'll just melt it all down into a button and pour it. There's our silver mud, our filter paper, and a little bit of borax in a crucible. We'll melt her down. I think this works. Moment of truth here. Nice. Well, let's see if we can get that slag off. Huh. Why is it all copper colored? All right, we'll try again here. Let's see if we can get this thing going. Well, that's the best I could get, and I'm really disappointed with it. Silver is apparently a lot harder. I must have done something wrong. I think there's a bunch of base metals in here still. I think there's some copper in there. So what I'm going to do is just back to what I know. I'm going to take a cupel, put it in there with a little bit of bismuth, and refine it as best I can, and then at least we'll get a nice, shiny, silver-colored button. All right, before going in the furnace, we have 76 grams which where did the rest of my silver go? I was expecting, I think roughly about 110, 105 grams. So I've lost about 30 grams somewhere in the filter paper left over in the solution. So I'm gonna have to go do a little more research on how to work this silver. I've turned the furnace way down and I've let it cool down slowly. So hopefully we won't get any silver sprouts when I pull it out. that off there we go see if we can get it out of there 
All right, guys, well, let's continue to fumble our way through this. It's been the next day. A couple things I want to show you. I ended up with this silver button here out of the cupelling furnace. I tried to shine it up with a little HCL. That was a mistake because it turned the surface real gray, dull gray color because I think it made silver chloride on the surface. So don't use HCL to clean up your silver. And also I want to show you what I found in this bucket. I think I found the rest of our silver. So apparently there was still a bunch of silver. See down there the mud left in our solution. I guess I kind of rushed it there yesterday and so I won't make you watch it but I will filter all this out then I'm going to smelt it down in a crucible and get all our silver together so hopefully we can get up back to that between 100 and 110 grams we're looking for. The next step is to take our silver button and cemented silver which is in the bottom of this crucible. This is the one I used the other day and look at how pretty blue that flux is, that slag. Uh, but now I'm going to melt this down in the furnace pour it into our cone mold. I've used quite a bit of borax and I've added a little bit of potassium nitrate to try and oxidize off some of that last little base metals that's in there. We'll pour it into our cone mold and then we can see how pure our silver is. We're starting to cool and crack here. But I wanted to show you, I hope you can see there, that metal edge down there. You can actually see all the way through the slag and see the silver button in the bottom. So that is unusual for me. I usually have a bunch of iron and junk in the slag. And two also tells me we didn't have a whole lot of base metals that oxidized. So that's good. It should be pretty pure. It's a lot of junk on our silver there. So there's our silver. Boy, it looks really nice. Nice and shiny. But there's some slag on it. But man, look at the color of that slag. Just sapphire blue. Beautiful stuff. Our silver button's all de-slagged now. Nice and pretty. Let's see how much it weighs here. Should be, we're hoping between 100 and 110. 104, we'll take it. 104 is not too bad. And probably the, the rest is in the filter paper and stuff that uh, I, didn't, I didn't deal with. Um, so I, I lost a little bit of silver, but that's okay. We got 97% of it here in this button. Oh, slag's acting up. Just can't get over how cool that is. Well, now I want to try something that's probably crazy, but I'm going to give it a shot here. I have a melting dish in this furnace. It's up to 850 degrees Fahrenheit above the melting point of silver. And I'm going to sprinkle some borax in there. And then I'm going to put our silver in there and remelt it and I'm gonna th this should be pretty pure 98 99% somewhere in there but I want to try and melting I want to try to melt the silver again have it sit in that dish and any of the base metals that sit on the surface they're gonna oxidize just like they do in a cupel but the melting dish doesn't absorb the oxides, but hopefully there will be a little ring of borax right around the edge of the metal interface and the melting dish. And those, that we only have a, a percent, so one gram, and hopefully those oxides will absorb into that borax ring. And then we'll have a really nice, super high purity silver button. I can control the temperature really, really well. So once it's molten and super pure, I can turn it down to about 1600, 1650 degrees, let it cool. There won't be any silver sprouts because I've let it cool very slowly and we'll have a nice, super, hopefully perfect round silver button. Now let's see if I can do this here. What do we got going on? Okay, so our silver's melting. 
See all those little raindrops down there? That's going into the borax, so that's good. We're purifying as we melt. That's actually exactly what I wanted to happen. All right, another check here. Oh man, that is working so good. All those oxides are getting absorbed into that ring of borax. The key is to not have the borax cover the surface of the silver. So if you cover the surface of the silver, it can't get open to the oxygen, but man, that's working just perfect. Refining away there. All right, last check. Look at that, a perfect mirror finish on there. So that is as refined as I can get it. So now what we'll do is we'll turn it down. Silver melts about 760 something degrees, 1760. So I'm gonna turn it down to about 1650. And that way it'll solidify while it's still very hot and it won't have those silver sprouts and have silver shoot all over the place. So we'll check back on that in a little bit. It's gonna take a while to cool down and I want it to cool down and solidify. So it'll be half an hour or so, but we'll check back on that. Then I'll pull it out and hopefully we'll have super high purity silver. All right, we'll have a look here. It's been here about an hour. Ooh, silver sprouts. Oh, dang. Um, all right, that's not what we wanted. That's pretty nice in color. Get a little bit of that flux cleaned off of there and might have a winner. Well, that works so well with the silver, but I think I'm going to do it with the gold as well. I got a separate melting dish, a little bit of borax in there. I'll see if there's any leftover impurities in the gold. The gold will be a lot easier because we don't have the silver sprout problem. So I'll heat that up to about 2,050 degrees, melt the gold, see if we can get any oxides forming, and then I'll just let it cool down slowly and hopefully pull it out of there as a nice little round button with a good finish on the surface. I'm going to try and clean up this silver bar a little bit and there's been some debate online about what the best one is to use. Sulfuric is supposed to work well but it'll dissolve some of the silver. Apparently oxalic acid will also work so I'm going to add just a little bit of oxalic acid here. And that should dissolve any of the borax, any of the flux that's on there. It's on the heating pad. We'll heat it up and see what we come up with. Here's a peek at our gold. Beautiful mirror finish on there. So all the oxides are off. There was very little, actually. I checked a couple times and there wasn't any, any beads coming off of there hardly at all. So it was quite pure from the beginning. So I'm going to turn it down to about 1800. That should leave the borax molten and the gold solidified. And then I can pluck it out of there and cool it off in some water. Well, it worked. Ooh, got it. Nice. Clean borax, a little yellow tinge, but not much, and a beautiful gold button. Look at that. Man, that is cool. That is so cool. Well, our silver's in there. I think it's doing wonders on the silver, so I'll drop our gold in there too. Get them both cleaned up. We've been boiling about half an hour here. There's where we're cleaning off our slag. I don't know if sulfuric would be better or not. What do you guys use to clean up your, your precious metal bars? Well, I'm going to try a little bit of the sulfuric acid. See if we can speed this up. About 10% or so. It 
see how that goes. We might lose a little bit of silver, but hopefully we get a nice shiny surface. The sulfuric did the job. I'm still not real happy with it, but it's got all the slag off and shined it up real nice. So let's see how much our silver weighs. I think we, we had 104, I think, 104 grams. So that's pretty darn close to 104, 103.71. Again, we probably lost a little bit with the filter paper and stuff. I, I didn't process that. So we lost a couple, three or four, five grams there. And then for our gold, I think it was 29.65 or something. So we lost three hundredths, four hundredths of a gram by re-smelting it down and cleaning it up. Now, let me take them over to the XRF gun and figure out what percent purity we have. Well, now it's our ceremonial stamp here. M. There we go. Mount Baker, AG for silver, 001. I don't know how I'm going to fit all that on this gold now. There we go. Mount Baker, AU001 and MBAG001. The first refined gold from Mount Baker Mining and Metals. Well, it's been a long process, a long journey, but I finally arrived at refined gold and silver, parted, separate gold and silver. Really, really nice stuff. I do still have this bead here that I'm going to do something with later. But I want to give a big thank you to everyone who's helped me, supported me, and all the other YouTubers out there that I followed in their footsteps to come with this refined precious metals. And as a big thank you to all my subscribers and watchers, I want to put these two up for sale. A lot of you have asked me over the years if I'd sell you gold and silver. Well, now is your chance. These are going to go on eBay. I'll post a link down below so you can check them out in eBay. The other thing I get asked a lot about when I produce some really, really fancy, cool looking slag. And so I'm going to put this in a bag and this will also be for sale on eBay. So check that out. And if you'd like to support us directly, you can check out Super Thanks on YouTube or also our Patreon page. Links in the description below. So thanks everybody for watching. This was a huge video for me. I really appreciate all you guys watching. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next one.